Hi, this is Brother Richard. This is Brother Richard. And today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. <coughs> this will be part 382. The title of our lesson today is Reality Transit Age Transition. We're going to go into an explanation of this momentarily. Scripture defines a reality as a state of existence. Also, it's called an age. Uh, as noted by the Greek term aeon. So it's a state of existence that progresses upon what is called a course, a transition, a path. In some realities, states of existence, they have eternal courses, and some have temporal courses. The age in which we exist, the state of existence in which we exist, is temporal. It has a termination. What does that mean? It means that its course is going to run out. And it's going to experience a transition into another age, state of existence. That's a question here. Yes. When we enter into eternity after the Great White Throne, and we begin to experience the experiences of the ages. Mm -hmm. Is that all one age, or is it a number of individual no, ages? No, infinite number of infinite. ages. Okay. And this still applies as age transition? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. But in eternity, the ages never end, they just run into... Right, each other. Yes. Uh, connect with another state of existence, which has a course, of experiences which connects to another state of existence known in, in infinitum. Now we find, the scripture teaches, that this particular age, state of existence, its course is going to end at the time of the proclamation of the kingdom of the heavens. Turn to Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. What end? The end of this age. The end of this reality. This state of existence. Its course will be completed. Starting with the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdoms. Why? Because that proclamation is heralding another age, transitioning into a beginning when this age ends. This age, of course, is temporal, will never be repeated. <clears throat> now we want to take a look at the end of the age, the series of Things that are prophesied to happen center around what I call four interventions of the Lord. Four supernatural interventions of the Lord will characterize the end of the course of this age. Scripture indicates the ending of this current age will be characterized by four interventions of the Lord Jesus Christ. Each intervention will involve a judgment and a deliverance. I'm going to repeat that. Each intervention will involve a judgment and a deliverance. The first judgment 
will be against the whole human race in general and the religious leaders who have failed to be faithful to God. Jeremiah 25, verse 30. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words. And say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, <clears throat> and utter his voice from his holy habitation. <clears throat> he, shall mighty, he shall mightily roar upon his habitation, the planet earth. He shall give a shout, as they that tread, against all the inhabitants of the earth. So this judgment will be focused upon the whole human race. Its <clears throat> main thrust will be upon the religious leaders. Drop down to verse 35. Same chapter. And the shepherds shall have no way to flee nor the principle of the flock to escape. A judgment comes upon them sealing their doom. All of them. Turn to Jeremiah 23, verse 2. Here we have another allusion to this judgment. Jeremiah 23, verse 2. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. So that judgment is going to be pronounced in verse 35 of chapter 25. Hmm. Now we said that each intervention <clears throat> would be characterized by a judgment and a deliverance. Scripture indicates with the judgment will come the freedom proclaimed by the gospel and the willingness of those who hear it to pursue it. So for the first time in this age the restriction against truth will be taken down and it will be nothing to stand against truth being proclamated, proclaimed throughout the earth. That is the deliverance. Matthew 24, verse 45 to 46. You cannot proclaim truth on a global scale in this current reality. It will not be allowed. But at that time, it will be unrestricted. <clears throat> Hence, the G Jesus says the gospel will go to every quarter of the earth. It will fill the whole world, despite the Fourth Empire being here, despite <clears throat> the lies that at uh, uh, four time stood against the proclamation of truth. There will be no barriers to hearing the unadulterated, absolute word of God. Now, <clears throat> Jeremiah 24, verse 45 to 46. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. So from the time of the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom to the second time of the intervention of the Lord, the gospel will be free to be proclaimed to whosoever desires to hear it. Let's go on. 
Scripture indicates the next intervention, you said there would be four, this would be the second intervention, will be the return of the Lord to gather the church into communities on the earth. John, the 10th chapter, verse 16. Jesus speaks about this as being the main thrust of his activities upon his return. John 10, verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So the Lord is saying here at a time <coughs> would come in which he personally would appear and gather those of his who are not of the descendants of Abraham. They're not Israelites. They're his. They belong to the other groups outside of Israel. He says they would hear his voice and he would gather them and there'd be one fold and one shepherd. Excuse me. A sneeze coming on. It's okay, we're good. Turn to Jeremiah 23, verse 3. We see this happening in this prophecy. And I will gather, I, the Lord, will gather the remnant of my flock, the non-Israelites, out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. So he's going to appear to these that are his. He says they will hear his voice. He's going to speak to them. He's going to direct them. He's going to lead them to their folds. Joseph. Yes. Is he speaking of people in different countries that are his and he's speaking to to come together? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You can so see he, that. So he's not, literally, he's not talking about America. No, no, no. You can see that now. In diehard Islamic countries, they are having dreams and see, they see Jesus. In communist countries, they're having dreams. They see Jesus. He's calling them out. This is the preliminary uh, that's going to lead to the gathering. Now, Scripture indicates this Scripture we're talking about here. <clears throat> this intervention will include his sudden appearance and his immediate gathering of the faithful servants. So he appears suddenly and then he's going to call them to himself. Second Thessalonians, second chapter, verse one.
Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. Paul understood perfectly the doctrine of the gathering. He taught it. In uh, one of his epistles, I think it's 1 Thessalonians, he says, you don't have any need for me to repeat to you the things that I've already told you. They had the perfect plan of the progression that would lead to the end of this age. And they allowed it to be destroyed. Turn to Jude. Jude 3. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. That's 2, 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence, all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and earnestly exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. They had the whole counsel of God. Jude is reminding them, you know, you understand the plan. They didn't have this Tim LaHaye view of a rapture where everybody disappears and clothes are flying all over the place. They understood perfectly the plan of God and is going forth establishing his kingdom, but they didn't value it. We have here the apostle pleading with them to be faithful to what they have been given. And it fell on deaf ears. So we are here entering in the period of the beginning of sorrows where because of the lack of diligence of those who should have known better, it's going to have to be re-taught to God's people. But let's go on. So we see the intervention. Second intervention will begin with the sudden appearance of the Lord and his gathering of the other sheep to himself. This, as we talked about in the last lesson, starts with the gathering of the leadership, the prototokis leaders, and then ultimately the gathering of the remaining of the flock, the elders. Where does the judgment come in at this? Turn to Luke, uh, excuse me, turn to Matthew 24, <clears throat> verse 48 to 51. Matthew 24, verse 48 to 51. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. So this is an individual knows the plan of God, that the Lord is going to return and return suddenly. But he, in his own mind, wants to take advantage of his position and the time that he thinks he has. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of. <clears throat> the only time that organized religion teaches this, that he's going to come in a time when you're not expecting it, is when they teach the rapture. That's the only time they teach this. 
Well, this is not referring to the rapture. <clears throat> Why? Because you see what happens to this evil servant. Verse 51, And shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a judgment. It's not a deliverance for this individual. They teach you the rapture is a deliverance. If you're here and you may not be doing what you should do, well, you're going to go anyway, and uh, the Lord will take care of it. Well, not in this case. What does it mean? So cut him asunder. It means it cuts off his relationship with this individual. Well, when he cuts off his relationship with this individual, that means, that means he's in the position of an unsaved person. And then when that happens, it says, he shall appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. What does that mean? Well, we know that Jesus called the scribes and the Pharisees hypocrites. And uh, <clears throat> also along that line are those of the first judgment. Well, this individual is going to join them in the place where they are. The group of the first judgment, the second judgment, is going to place that unfaithful servant with those already in hell. So here you have two comings of two judgment pronounces and two deliverances. Is it true to say that they have a, a specific area in hell? Because uh, I'm thinking about uh, at some point they get to outer darkness and they're completely sanctioned up, aren't they? Well, wherever the first group is, he's going to be That's added with them. And the first group is in a region with <clears throat> the inference is um, the beautiful land, the beautiful estates that they have are now burning pitch and they are in an alien environment in which they cannot um, um, operate, they cannot uh, function and they're crying for pain and agony mentally and physically. But they're not in the general hell population as the rich man was with Lazarus. No, no, no because the punishment calls for something exactly. different. Okay. It's more egregious than that, that individual. Because mm. he's not screaming in pain, well he's in pain and everything, but he can solve a decent conversation. Sure. These people are in such egregious torment that no, they're... <laughs> You said decent conversation. <laughs> well, yeah, he talks to Abraham about, hey, uh, uh, how about this, this, and this? And uh, Abraham responds, well, you can't get that from these individuals. They're, they're too much, they're weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Sure. <clears throat> so we see a second judgment. <clears throat> Turn to Luke, 21st chapter. Here we see the appearance of the Lord. Luke 21, 25 to 27. And there should be signs in the sun and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. It's going to happen suddenly, just like it will happen suddenly at the second coming, or the last coming. There'll be signs in the sun, signs in the moon, signs in the stars, and suddenly he'll appear. <clears throat> the same as it, this one. Men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The powers <coughs> comes from a, a Greek term, dynamis. It's referring to the potentates, the second stringers in the heavens. It's a judgment against them. They're going to be brought down, and their power taken away from them and imprisoned in the heart of the earth. And the judgment is going to go against <coughs> the evil servants who were unfaithful. They're going to experience torment. The deliverance, of course, is going to be the gathering. Gathering. Notice what it says here. Verse 27, And then 
shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Then will they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. What does Paul say? He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. So he comes, everyone sees him, and he gathers the faithful unto himself. Drop down to verse 36. Same chapter. <clears throat> Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. If you're counted worthy to stand before him, you're going to be greatly rewarded. Praise Turn to Ephesians, first chapter. Verses 9 to 11. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So when do we come into our inheritance? When he appears to delegate it. When is he going to appear to delegate it? Luke 21, verse 25 to 27. Pray that you be accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man to receive your inheritance. Amen. So this is two supernatural interventions of the Lord which constitute judgment and deliverance. Now we're going to look at the third supernatural intervention. Scripture indicates the third intervention will involve the glorification and catch you away of the Prototokos saints. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 to 17. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, <clears throat> with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Now we see the difference <clears throat> between <clears throat> this intervention and the other two what did we just read 
about the second intervention. He comes down to earth. We stand before him. We receive our inheritance. This intervention, it talks about what? The Lord descending from heaven with a shout. And those that are alive and remain don't meet with him on the earth. They are taken into the clouds where they meet him. So you're looking at different reflections of the Lord's appearing. Mm -hmm. You cannot mix and match and say, well, yes, this is a rapture, or that's the second coming. Each individual gives you characteristics and activities that are germane to that particular intervention. It can be a judgment in which you have a deliverance and you have <clears throat> a, a result of that on the earth. It can be a gathering in which you have <clears throat> a judgment and a deliverance on the earth. It can be a deliverance in which you don't have anything happening to the saints on the earth. They're taken from the earth and the activity is in the air and the clouds. Yes. Well, we know because of what the scripture is saying in these, in these verses here, without a doubt, this is the rapture. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> now we can go on from that. This is what we want to focus on here. We want to go on from that and show the uniqueness of the rapture. You say, how is it unique from all the other ones we've read? Because the individuals that are going to experience this are all going to experience it from the church communities. Turn to Revelation, second chapter. Starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. So we see the location. Ephesus. What is Ephesus? Ephesus is a community of Christians in a specific location on the earth. Am I correct? correct. Is this what the scripture is saying Ephesus here? Ephesus is the Pototicus church. Yes. <clears throat> Which the Lord is addressing. Okay. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith the Lord, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Drop down to verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Now what I want to focus on here deals with verse 5. <clears throat> Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee or else I will come unto thee or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He is going to this church community to judge it. Removing his candlestick means they cease from being a church. It's cutting them off. That's the rapture. I know you not. But it's talking about a specific location that he is going to appear at. We see every single letter, epistle, deals with the same principle. 
turn to <clears throat> Revelation, the second chapter, verse 16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee. He's coming to them. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This is judgment. From him. From him. Now. Drop down to... Chapter 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, so what is the location of this? Sardis. Sardis is a what? A community of saints in a specific ge geological location, correct? Unto the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that is not that thou livest and, and, and art dead. Now, verse 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. When is he coming upon them? At the rapture. The rapture is going to be a deliverance. It's going to be a judgment. <clears throat> Notice what he goes on to say. Verse 4. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. That's the rapture. It's a deliverance. It's a judgment. On what? The church communities. He's coming over Ephesus, Sardis, Philadelphia, and all those that are worthy are going to be changed and brought up, caught away to be with him in the clouds. And those that are under judgment are going to feel his wrath. Mm -hmm. Chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. <clears throat> I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Total rejection. Well, when is this going to happen? That's the only time it can happen. It didn't happen in his first ministry. It's not going to happen at the second coming because the way he describes his <clears throat> second coming is going to take place on the earth. This is a judgment in which conditions are going to be leveled upon those that are under the judgment but those that are worthy of glorification are taken off the earth. Revelation 3, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, the word patience there is endurance, 
the Lord, he's saying, because you have endured, I also will keep. The word keep there is guard, protect. Thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. They're going to be guarded from effects of the earth because they're going to be taken off the earth. It's a deliverance. So you have him speaking to the churches. Some are going to be delivered. Some are going to be judged. But it all takes place only, only over the churches. Church communities throughout the globe are going to experience the rapture. And them only. If you aren't in a church community, you are not going to experience the rapture. Mm. You might want to tell a few people. That's what the scripture is saying. The scriptures to the seven churches. Only the seven churches are qualified to make the rapture. Why? Because only the seven, well, not the seven churches, but the global churches yep. are been, been prepared for the rapture. So these are protected churches. Where was the gathering? The gathering was into the church communities. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the church communities are protected and enabling them to prepare for the rapture. People have this idea about um, planes suddenly going into a dive and uh, cars going out of control <clears throat> and all this other stuff. That's not what the scripture is telling us. The scripture is telling us it's a time in which <clears throat> man operates in um, a horse and buggy era to begin <clears throat> with. People are grinding at the mill, uh, working in the fields. <clears throat> There's no technology to speak of here <clears throat> and it centers over the church communities nobody on the housetop nobody elsewhere is going to be raptured unless they are in a church community hmm. well certain pastors seem to think that being saved yes. will make uh, sure that's, that they're in the that's what you need right. I look at it this way, brothers. When this thing goes down, you're going to have a pretty full plate. Say it again. When this thing goes down, you're going to have a pretty full plate. I can imagine. Because what you got to do is to give people a comprehension that they have never had and a preparation for something that they never, never uh, 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 prepared for. Sure. Couldn't even imagine. You got to destroy a belief system that organized religion has erected for years and years and years and years and years. And then once you erect that foundation, you got to build on it for them to expect God's plan and how it's going to work. That's a totally different reality that they've never comprehended. So it's a pretty full challenge. 